All right. The next four, I'll just go ahead and read them all because they're all related to each other. First one is, what are the differences between a prophet and a seer? Are the roles similar or are they separate in ancient Israelite religion? Is the role of seer more akin to tribal shamans, such as finding lost items with the aid of divination? Think in 1 Samuel 9 here. And how are such terms linked with soothsayers and being an Isha Elohim, man of God? Has the role of seer disappeared by the second temple period? Well, let's take the uh, the man of God one first. Uh, man of God is a phrase that's used, you know, not not a not a, a lot in the Old Testament. I mean, it's it's not rare, but it's used to refer to several different things. It, it's used, for instance, of the angel of the Lord in Judges thirteen. I mean, Samson's parents see this individual and hear, you know, what he has to say about, you know, the birth of their son. And, and they refer to him as Ish, you know, Ish Elohim, Ish Ha Elohim. So there's man of God there, but that's pretty limited. I mean, it's, it's really when it gets applied to the angel of the Lord, it, it's only in this passage. And again, you can see why it, it would be because they can't, they can't at least the first time around discern that this is anybody other than a a, a man and telling them what what God says, and so you know, it, it's it's not surprising we would get this label. Uh, secondly, it, it is used of named individuals that are spokespeople for God again, who also receive divine revelation. Uh, Moses, for instance, Deuteronomy thirty three one, Joshua fourteen six, David is called you know man of God in Second Chronicles eight fourteen and Nehemiah twelve twenty four. Uh, Shemaiah, who we don't know much about, is, is gets this label in First Kings twelve twenty two. Elijah, all right, Elisha in First and Second Kings, respectively. So you can have a a known figure called man of God. And what's interesting is is other than David uh, in that list, those those people are also called prophets. And that was part of the the, the question. Navi is prophet. We'll get to that in a moment. So right away we can see there's some overlap there. And thirdly, sometimes the phrase is used of an unidentified figure who speaks for God or, again, who could receive divine information, divine revelation. And probably the textbook example of this is 1 Samuel 9, uh, when a man, you know, unidentified man of God, you know, tells Saul about the donkeys and all this sort of thing. So, you know, you know what is a man of God? Well, it's somebody who, you know, was perceived as being God's spokesperson. And could receive divine revelation, divine information, and may or may not be also called a navi, okay, a, a prophet. So there, there's some overlap. There are prophets, as I wrote in Unseen Realm and have commented elsewhere, prophets are people who speak for God. Now, what, what these other terms are going to get us into, though, is not so much the reception of divine information, but the how. Uh, is it through a vision? Is it through a dream? Is it an auditory voice? Is it a divine encounter? Is it casting lots or some other form of divination? That's where you get some of this other vocabulary that that sort of focuses attention on the how. Again, how how are they getting divine revelation? So the question, you know, re- referenced a few of these terms, but I'll just you know hit a couple myself here. We have koza in Hebrew, which is from the verb koza, again to see or to have a vision. Terms used a few times in tandem with ro'eh, which is from ra'ah to see, so a seer. Uh, again, is another term in navi, of course, which is prophet. It's interesting, in, in 1 Chronicles 29.29, 29, uh, ro'eh, and uh, trying to think here, which, which is, let me, let me just click out to the verse, because sometimes they overlap as synonyms, and in other cases, they, uh, it depends which one it is. So 1 Chronicles 29.29, 29, I think is worth bringing up. It says this, now, the acts of King David from first to last are written in the Chronicles of Samuel the seer, and that's Ro'eh, and in the Chronicles of Nathan the prophet, that's Navi, and the Chronicles of Gad the seer, and that is Kose. So we have two seers here, but the terms are different, Ro'eh and Kose, but they're obviously you know, sort of used in tandem here. And one of the seers, okay, Samuel, of course, is, is elsewhere called a prophet. The terms don't completely overlap because Nathan is distinguished from Gad in other passages. You have prophets and seers. In some cases, that both of those labels can be attributed to one person, and in other passages, they are kept separate. 
one guy's a prophet, the other guy's the seer. So it, it, it's kind of hard to know, you know, it's kind of hard. Let me just put it this way. It's kind of hard to be categorical and say this one couldn't be that one just in toto because there is overlap. But there are circumstances where perhaps one, a person was perceived as one thing and not the other. You know, it's just, it's hard to tell if there's any real consistency here, but there are, there are patterns at least. In the, in the monarchy narratives, again, what scholars would refer to as the Deuteronomistic history and, you know, what, again, just the, the lay reader would, would, you know, refer to as the, his, you know, historical texts, historical books, Samuel King's Chronicles, that sort of thing. In those books, prophet and seer are frequently distinguished. Again, Nathan and Gad would be an example. They're mentioned together in a verse, but one is a prophet, the other is a seer. Uh, and I think, you know, what we have going on here in, in situations like that is prophets were, of course, oracles. They did get divine information. God spoke to them. You know, word of the Lord came to, uh, you know, such and such and said, you know, hey, go over and talk to the king. Okay, that that does happen. But seers, that terminology often has something to do with a with either a vision or a dream you know, something like that. So it's really kind of the mode of revelation that is being highlighted or distinguished, kind of a subset um, when we get to this other terminology. And again, we're not saying that prophets couldn't have visions. Okay, All we're saying is that while the Navi could have a vision, the prophet could have a vision, when, when the term seer is used, that's sort of what that person is known for. That's how, uh, it, to the community, that it has become known that this person receives divine information. It's through this this modus operandi, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the sub questions I think was about are, is, is, are seers akin to like shamans again, the, or, or, or people who use uh, methods of divination again. That there there seems to be a, a relationship there, so that seems to be the case. Another term is uh, kasam or kesam. These are English translations would would be something like medium or well, let's just go to let's just go to the one interesting example here because you have soothsayer diviner medium it just, the english translations vary so much so first samuel 28 8 this is the medium at endor passage which i've referenced a lot because of the elohim reference here with the, the deceased samuel but in verse 8 we have so saul disguised himself and put on the other garments and went he and two men with him and they came to the woman by night and he he said divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whoever I shall name to you. So the the command there to divine is the Hebrew lemma kasam. So right away there there's this association of of some methodology to to solicit the other side and to get divine information. Kasam is typically negative. Here we have the medium at Endor. She's going to be a questionable figure, a negative figure because of what she's doing, you know, communicating with spirits and whatnot. Deuteronomy 18, 10, and verse 14 use this, again, for forbidden practices. Uh, so kasam is a, is a term and a notion that would often be used to reference things that are forbidden or pagan methods of divination or whatnot. Some scholars, though, have, have speculated, and there, there's no way to really nail this down, that kasam could mean to cut in pieces. And that would be a reference to creating objects of wood, whether they be lots that are cast or even arrows. There, there, there's an episode in one of the, one of the uh, I think, I'm trying to remember, remember which one of the King's book this is in, but it's not coming to me right now, where uh, the, the prophetic figure asked you know, the king, hey, throw down some arrows here you know, as, as a sign. And so that, that, that sort of thing wooden objects that were used to cast lots in some way or or to read in an in an oracular sense. Again, I, I, we're not really scholars aren't really sure about that, whether Kasam actually means that sort of thing or not, but it is associated with again doing something to solicit divine information. Now, for those who are interested in this, um I can't really, you know, I can't post the book. I mean I I did a paper on the Old Testament response to pagan divination where I pointed out that some of these these divination methods that are condemned in Deuteronomy 18 are actually approved elsewhere of, of prophetic figures. So the paper addresses why that is, and it has to do with who's the source of the information. Is it the true God or something else? Uh, it has some divine counsel uh, implications in there. So that's something I could put uh, with this episode to post. But there's actually a book, if, if 
those of you who have access to the Divine Council bibliography, there's a book, a whole book on divination by Ann Jeffers, J-E-F-F-E-R-S, that I've, I found somewhere. But uh, the, the book is in PDF form, uh, and, it, and it's part of that uh, that collection. So you could you could go look that up. Um, of course, these aren't the only sources on on divination these these kinds of terms, but. I like Jeffers book because it's it's she has really succinct discussions on all of the terms that are associated in any way with these sorts of individuals, seers, prophets, that sort of thing, and also the terminology of of uh, divination. It's it's really a nice nice work. 